To kickstart this video, I'm going to give you an overview of the Indigo 2. And to start off with, I'm going to go through the front panel of the machine with you. I have to say that this is one of the cooler looking silicon graphics machines in my opinion. On the top left hand side of the front panel, you've got the silicon graphics logo. And on the flap which lowers, you've got the Indigo 2 logo which is silk screened. Now go ahead and lower the front flap. And once the flap is lowered, it reveals the power button as well as a recessed reset button, a SCSI CD-ROM drive, the front part of the locking bar for the machine, as well as a blank which covers the hard drive bay. You'll notice these two tabs. What they are used for is to remove the front panel of the machine to allow you to disassemble the rest of the machine, but we'll go through this at a later stage in the video. Taking a look at the rear panel of the machine going from left to right, the left hand side of the rear panel you've got the power supply for the machine with a standard kettle plug power input. The locking bar for the machine, two mini DIN serial ports, a PS2 keyboard port, a PS2 mouse port, an AUI Ethernet port, a parallel port, a 10 base T Ethernet port, an external SCSI port, and on the right hand bottom side of the rear panel you've got the inputs and outputs for the onboard sound device. As far as the graphics outputs go, you've got a 13W3 connector for graphics as well as a port for the optional 3D glasses. I'm now going to take you through the process of removing the machine's covers. To start this process off, I'm going to lower the front flap of the machine and I'm then going to remove the locking bar. And pushing down on the two tabs that I mentioned before, I'm going to remove the front cover or the panel. Okay, this reveals two tabs which I can push up on, which now allows me to lift the case off. And this reveals the insides of the machine. I'm now going to take you on a tour of the machine's insides. I'm going to start off by going over the front side of the machine. The left hand side you've got the power LED for the machine, the power button, the reset button, and the machine accommodates a 5.25 inch optical drive. In this case I've got a 5.25 inch DVD-ROM drive installed. The drive itself sits on a sled which allows it to be removed. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the drive. And as you can see, it slides out easily. Below the optical drive bay is a vent which allows airflow through to the motherboard and CPU. On the right hand side of the vent you've got the system speaker. On the right hand side of the front of the machine you've got two drive bays which also have sleds fitted which can accommodate two 3.5 inch SCSI discs. These discs are attached to the internal system SCSI bus, which has a maximum throughput of 10 megabytes per second. I'm now going to go ahead and remove the optical drive bay to reveal the system's CPU and motherboard. To do this, firstly I have to disconnect the SCSI connector at the back of the drive bay. That comes off like that. And then there are two screws. Phillips screws at the front of the machine that I have to undo and they are kept in place and have springs which allow them to move outwards and then the drive bed itself just slots backwards and then I am able to lift it out. This reveals the CPU and motherboard of the system as well as the RAM banks. Now that the optical drive bay is removed, we can take a look at the system CPU and RAM. But before this, I'm just going to point out the system speaker, which sits on the right-hand side of the vent. As for the CPU in the machine, it is fitted with a MIPS R4400 CPU with secondary cache running at 150 MHz. So this is a very mid-range CPU for this type of machine. The motherboard accommodates 
12 SIM cards and the type of RAM used is 72 pin fast page mode SIM memory. In the case of this machine it's got 96 megabytes of memory installed. This brings us to the business end of the machine, the section which houses the graphics. Firstly, I'm going to explain how the airflow is managed in this section of the machine. Towards the front of the machine is a vent, behind which is a fan, which draws the hot air from between the graphics cards through a vent which is situated on the side of the machine. I'm going to lower this door, which very neatly allows you to gain access to the graphics module, as well as any other option cards which you might have fit slotted into the machine. The machine accommodates both EISA and GIO64 cards. In the case of this machine, I've got the Extreme Graphics board set fitted, and it is a triple layer graphics set, and it represents the most powerful graphics that was available for a desktop machine when the system was released. This particular board set slots into a GIO64 slot. The system is fitted with a rather hefty power supply module, which unfortunately isn't labelled to indicate what its rating is or what its voltage outputs are. This concludes the system hardware tour. So let's see how she runs. I'm going to go ahead and power up. Firstly lower the front flap. And there we go. And that hard drive sounds like a jet turbine starting. This brings us to the log on screen. I'm going to go ahead and log on. As you can see, also not the fastest machine in the world. She also takes quite a while to come up. So now I'm going to run a couple of demos to try and compare the performance of this machine to the ND, taking into account that the CPU in this machine is running at 150 megahertz and the CPU in the ND was running at 200 megahertz. Okay, I'm going to open up PowerFlip. I'm going to open up two instances of PowerFlip. So there we go, two instances, open. I'm going to display the performance to give you an idea of what we're getting out of the machine. Okay, so in both instances you're getting around about 35 to 40 frames a second, 572 polygons per frame. I'm going to open up Atlantis as well. And I'll also bring up two instances of Atlantis. So you give me an idea of the system's performance. And the interesting thing to note here is you can see that we're getting 17 to 18 frames a second out of PowerFlip, and we've got two instances of Atlantis open at the same time. I'm going to go ahead and open up Doom as well. Taking you back to the performance that I was getting out of the Indy, I had an instance of Atlantis open, an instance of PowerFlip, as well as an instance of Doom. And as you can see, the frame rate that I was getting in PowerFlip was far less than I'm getting out of the Indigo 2. Now back to the Indigo 2 to compare the performance of these two machines. Okay, so we've got an instance of Doom running, we've got two instances of PowerFlip running at about 13 to 14 frames a second and two instances of Atlantis. So as you can see, although the CPU of this machine is running at 50 megahertz less than that of the Indy, because it has the extreme graphics board set installed, you are actually getting a performance increment. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to close these demos. And I'm going to run quick. I don't expect to get an improvement in Quake because it was running in software mode on the Indy and in this machine it will be running in software mode as well. 
So that should take advantage of the CPU and the graphics system shouldn't really have a role to play here. Okay, so I'm going to open up the software version of Quake. In the meantime, close all these windows. I'm going to try and open the window to a larger scale than it was on the Indian and see what we get out of it. Before I continue with the demonstration of Quake on the Indigo 2, I'm going to take you back to the performance that I was getting on the Indy. As you can clearly see, the performance is rather similar, but take note of the fact that Quake is running in a much smaller window here. Now back to the Indigo 2 so we can continue with the performance comparison. And what you notice, although there isn't a large improvement, it does seem to be running better than it did on the MD, which is rather interesting considering that the CPU is running at 50 megahertz less. So it does show that although it's not making use of OpenGL, the improved graphics option definitely has a small role to play. However, if you compare one of these systems to the MD, there are a couple of advantages. Obviously, you have the ability to install a more powerful graphics option, but a very important aspect of this machine is the fact that you can install an optional optical disk. And this can become very useful when it comes to installing programs or reinstalling IREX if you need to. So it's a very useful option to have. And as you can see from the hardware demonstration or the tour that I gave you of the machine, the machine is incredibly robust. It's probably the one, one of the most solid machines I've ever come across. Now I'm going to go ahead and close Quake. And that concludes this demonstration. I hope that you enjoyed it and I hope that you found it informative.